I'm a lifelong Southerner married to an Indian man who grew up in South Africa during apartheid. And I am fiercely proud of both. If you don't like that, well, bless your heart. I'm Cheryl Parbu, and this is Southern Life, Indian Wife. If you're from Atlanta and ever tuned into The Burt Show in the morning, you'll love this week's guest. Brian Moot spent nearly three years in Atlanta on The Burt Show before leaving to co-host The Morning Show at 97.1 Amp in Los Angeles. I'm so excited he joins me in this episode, and y'all, I barely kept it together. Brian's originally from Washington, but he spent enough time in the South to know what it's all about. He divides his time between Los Angeles and Atlanta, and his career as a comedian and radio personality give him this amazingly open-eyed perspective that I so enjoy. For this writer, finding out what makes people tick is pure gold. We talk about each of our short-lived teaching careers and Atlanta's god-awful humidity. He talks about Kim Kardashian's kimono clothing line and the political climate and snowflake culture we're in and how it affected the Burt Show programming after the 2016 presidential election. He even gives me showbiz advice for my son. He's candid and kind at the same time and that smart kind of funny that I love to be around. I'm very pleased to welcome Brian Moot. Okay, so I am super excited to have you here with me, Brian. Thanks so much for taking time to chat with me. Yeah, of course. This this is going to be exciting. Yeah, very exciting. So, okay, so the podcast is called Southern Life Indian Wife. And a lot of the time I talk about culture and what it's like to be in the South and um, who Southerners are, but you're totally not a Southerner, right? No, no, no. You live in L.A. I grew up as about as far away from the South and technically in terms of Atlanta, like I literally think on the Pacific Northwest about as far away as you can get would be Island, Washington, like 30 minutes from the Canadian border. So like diagonally, oh, wow. I don't think I could be any farther from the South <laughs> if I tried. <laughs> Definitely in the not. United States. Yeah. But you did live in Atlanta for a couple of years while you were on the Burt show, yeah. right? Yeah, I did morning radio in Atlanta for almost three years. Um, oh, my girlfriend lives in Atlanta. So I'm in Atlanta. Man, I'm still in Atlanta probably a good, you know, 10 to 12 weekends a year and then a lot of holidays and vacations. I still have a good foot in the South, which I really enjoy because it's yeah. so different just as a place than from where I grew up. So it's always kind of nice to me. I've I've been someone who's lived in Boston, New York, Los Angeles now, Seattle. So I, I kind of enjoy having a reason to be in the South. There's so many things I love about the South that mm-hmm. just kind of makes it a, just a different pace for me, especially living in LA now. Oh yeah. I can just imagine. Well, so I guess, you know, you kind of maybe have earned a little bit of a Southerner badge to you for be, for being here <laughs> so often then, right? <laughs> like I lived through the I-85 burning up. So I feel like that's when I earned my, my, uh, my stripes <laughs> of being, an AT alien Atlanta resident was when we all had to deal with that. <laughs> the I 85 freeway burning, oh which was a national God. news story, which I think is hilarious. So, yeah, that was hilarious. Yep. That was quite an interesting thing because that man that affected our traffic. We have tra- Okay. So uh, you live in LA and then you've been mm-hmm. here. What is our traffic like compared to there? Um, I, here's the thing about LA, LA, the traffic in Los Angeles is worse. But Mm. you don't have to sit in it if you don't want to. You just the people who have to commute long distances like they just kind of have accepted their fate. Um, The thing with Atlanta is you have to sit in it. You have no way to avoid (laughs) the drive from Woodstock or Kennesaw or Lawrenceville into the city. And it all bottlenecks at one point, which is very similar to L.A., where you have the bottleneck of the 75, 85, 400. Just such a bad design where everything just kind of mashes into itself right in the center of the city. But the thing is, is like you can avoid it in LA where you just, there's other cities around. So your commute may not be into Atlanta, but Atlanta, like Atlanta's it. There's not a whole lot going Mm -hmm. on outside (laughs) of Atlanta. There's no, like, you know, as as good as Kennesaw and as big as like, you know, Decatur and stuff, those cities are growing and having their own businesses and industries. Like really everything is in Atlanta. So at some point in time, it just traffic is unavoidable and it just, the humidity makes it worse. Just, oh, God. I, it, even though it's hot in L.A., just humidity is such a different type of just like soul crushing heat where your lip is sweating and you just <laughs> sweat on your shirt and air conditioning doesn't help. It just it's just swampy. Yeah, it's like you're walking through soup some days. It's oh, awful. I've had 
I've had my day, my entire day plans changed by the moment I walked out the door. I've had plans. I've been like, you know what? I'm going to go down to Pont City Market. I'm going to take the dogs to fetch dog park. We're going to go drink some beers and go to the Beltline. And then as soon as my front door opened, I was like, guys, it's an inside day. All of us. We're going to watch uh, yep. movies. That's right. We're going the to the movie theater. <laughs> And the dogs look at you the same. Like we have, my girlfriend and I have two dogs. They don't even want to go outside either. They will turn around and just be just as happy. Like, yeah, you know what? This is a bad idea. This is too hot. Let's all just, no, let's call it a day. Yep. Absolutely. My dogs are the same way. Yeah. So that commute that everybody has here in Atlanta, though, I guess that's why so many people know who you are here because we're stuck in our cars and have to listen to morning radio. So that's a big funny. Morning radio is. Yeah, morning radio is a huge thing I'm finding in in those major cities. Like I've been in Dallas on radio, Atlanta on radio, um, Seattle, any major city that has like the mecca of their commute. You know, Los Angeles has multiple commutes of different areas, but people really just, you know, podcasts are great and podcasts really kill the midday where you're in your mm-hmm. office and you've got seven hours to kill. And you're like, you know what, I'm gonna listen to this entire conversation. But morning radio can be just so mindless. You're It's early. You're tired. You don't, you know, you you don't want to think too much and it's just so much easier just to, you turn your car and it's already on the station that you (laughs) like. So in terms of media, as I know, podcasting and audio media in general is becoming such a larger way to reach audiences and Mm -hmm. morning radio is still one that just emerges as kind of the front runner in terms of radio in general. And radio is just such an easy, free medium. And that's the other thing, too. I know we yell, you know, people are like, I hate commercials. It's like, well, would you rather pay a subscription fee? Because you could do that if you want to. <laughs> right. No, I don't think people want to do that. <laughs> no. Yeah. But, you know, that whole morning thing, like, I have to admit, I had probably only heard you on the radio a couple of times um, before Brad and John were suggesting that I talk to you because I was always mm-hmm. in during that uh, rush hour time. I was in carpool line dropping my kids off at school. <laughs> And I couldn't yeah. listen to and the wait, that's, show. That's funny. We tried. And, and the Bird Show is one of those shows in Atlanta, if you know Atlanta radio well. It's one of those shows that you know, we try to walk the fine line. And I, we do that in L.A. as well, where we try to be cognizant of kids in the car and try to be a little bit more family friendly when that's happening. Um, but still, yeah. like even innuendo and kids are so much more inquisitive nowadays and they pick up on innuendo so much more quickly because of social media, because of YouTube, because of just the way entertainment's changed that innuendo almost leads to a worse conversation where (laughs) we had parents, we had parents be like, why couldn't you just say sex? Why did you have to say birds and the bees? Now they want to know what that is. And I got to explain it. Sex. They've heard that word a thousand times. They just think it's an adult thing and they don't ask any questions. (laughs) Right. That's a funny perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I would try to avoid radio shows with my son. Uh My youngest son is 11. Um, So he would play, he would stream YouTube videos of these British guys uh-huh. talking about their Fortnite games over my car stereo. So he went from listening to that kind of stuff to now he listens to Eminem. He's about to go into seventh grade. So I don't know oh, what yeah. I'm trying to shelter him from because now it's the worst. Yeah, well, I would say that Eminem's a real confidence booster. If you're going to walk into a school feeling confident, you know, yes. <laughs> maybe maybe to a detriment, <laughs> the irrational <laughs> confidence. But Eminem's not a rapper that raps to anybody to to be a you know scared of new things or be intimidated. So right. there is a plus side that can that's be true. It. Okay, so you were here in Atlanta for about three years, and then you went to L.A. and yep. you're on the radio there. Yeah, it was kind of crazy how that whole uh, thing worked out. I went from doing news talk radio in Seattle. Um, and I had a morning show in Seattle and then I was doing news talk, um, during the Trump election, actually, or during the Trump, uh, the primaries, the Republican primaries, I I was in Atlanta during the actual election. Mm. And, um, then I went from Seattle to Atlanta. Um, and I was there for two and a half, three years. And then Carson Daly retired from radio in LA and six months after he retired, they were looking at putting a new show together and, my contract was up in Atlanta and my goal has always been as much as I love Atlanta. I still do. I still love radio in Atlanta. I love the bird show. Everyone on it are, are friends of mine. Um, it was one of those things where you got to look at where you want your career at in the next five years. You, mm-hmm. you kind of plan your life out in blocks of five when you work in morning radio. And I'm a comedian. I've always wanted to get back to Los Angeles and these opportunities don't open up uh, very often to, to go start a show and, You know, the challenges of starting a show are different. You know, like when you're on a heritage top 40 show, that's number one, like the Burt show. I mean, shoot, we could do pretty much whatever we want to for, you know, 10 to 15, 20 minutes sometimes and stuff that's like would not fly on a brand new show. And now here you're kind of introducing yourself to the audience over and over again. 
And uh-huh. you, we, we kind of talk about it like, you know, consistency being good, but also you really don't have the luxury of just wasting time, you know, not being deliberate and trying to not be entertaining because it could be every day. It's someone's first time going, ah, I'm sick of Seacrest. Let's see what they're doing over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's interesting because I'm not in the radio business and this whole podcasting mm-hmm. thing is brand new to me. So getting a different perspective from people just about that whole yeah. wider yeah. world that's out there. That's awesome. Um, and so like one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is because you're kind of the opposite of me. I got married young. I had five kids young. I've been living in this world. I grew up a Southerner. I'm married to this Indian guy. I've raised my kids. I'm a writer. I'm a hermit when I write. I just sit uh-huh. in my house and I don't talk to anybody. So <laughs> <laughs> talking to you, is, I wanted to hear what your experience is like, because it sounds like you're you know, a complete extrovert and completely different from me. Um, well, I think it's the, the funny part about being, I had this conversation actually the other day with somebody because we were talking about millennials, a study uh, just came out that millennials are having trouble making friends at work. Um, and I'm on the upper end of the millennial spectrum. And, you know, because of social media, because of the other ways that we communicate, we're not so good at face-to-face communication. You know, like I don't, the idea of me breaking up with a girl face-to-face was like mortifying as soon as email started, you know, when I was in, when like, when I was in high school. Um, but I think for me, I was very uncomfortable public speaking, very uncomfortable, um, communicating in front of people, feeling judged, um, in almost an introverted way. But what I tell people is I'm not inherently an introvert, but stepping outside of what you had as your comfort zone for a long time Mm -hmm. is uncomfortable and can make people go like, I'm just, I'm, I'm that, that's not me. I'm introverted. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a social person. It's like, no, 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 you are a social person, but this new setting is different for you. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to feel awkward. And right. instead of running from that, you have to kind of push through it. And, you know, I've moved ar- around the country so many times that I've realized that, look, there's going to be a, mo- nobody steps into any new room and is like, well, I'm exactly the same as I am with my best friends. That's <laughs> impossible. You know, if you are that person, you're an obnoxious a sociopath who isn't listening to anybody or has any sort of like ability to feel the energy of a room. And we've all been around those people who never change their energy, no matter where they're at. Yeah. So I tell people that there's a difference between pushing yourself to be in uncomfortable positions and, and be yourself and people who definitely have like, you know, serious, actual anxiety issues when it comes to being in public places or generalized mm-hmm. anxiety or things. Those are different. I think that we nowadays have a tendency just to be like, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I'm anxious. It's like, yeah, I mean, anxious is still like a natural human feeling, but some of us can push through it just because yeah. we don't actually have the chemical imbalances that other people have. So right. I, it took right. me a long time. And I think stand up comedy was what ultimately got me to feel comfortable putting myself out there and, and, and being in front of people. Cause I remember in college, I would do anything I could to avoid public speaking. Oh like man. Anything I could do, which is funny because now I do it for a living every single day. <laughs> I'm speaking publicly on some form or platform or whatever. Do you ever get nervous or is it just kind of the nerves are gone? The nerves I get now are only for when, when it comes to stand up, when I'm being judged on something or, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's an audition showcase for like Conan O'Brien or the tonight show or something. And I'm trying to put a representation of my material out in a way that, you know, is very me, but also connects with an audience and gets you booked on the show. Um, I think one thing I've never had was nerve nerves about radio. And I'm not exactly sure why that is other than maybe because stand up to me was always so much more difficult. And, you know, to be honest, I kind of forget that that tens of thousands of people are listening to you at any one time, which I think is a a good thing and a bad thing. I think I mean, in my role as a comedian, it's great because I'm not I forget like this literally happened today. I've been um, I might have some pretty strong opinions on. Like the Kardashians, um, Kim taking the (laughs) word kimono and making it a Spanx line for herself, completely steamrolling the fact that kimono is a very traditional Japanese thing that means something to Japanese culture, but she doesn't care because her culture is money. So I went on a rant about, I went on a rant about the Kardashians really deep deep down, their culture is money. It's success. It's TV. They don't have like a heritage culture. They don't, Mm -hmm. kimono would never ring a bell to her because she's never been in a life where cultural things matter to her from her history. And so I'm, you know, on this blazing hot tear. And then five minutes later, Camila Cabello posted an Instagram story listening to our radio show as we introduced one of her songs. And I was like, oh, my God, I totally forgot. These people live in the neighborhood. (laughs) 
<laughs> like here I am taking a blowtorch to Kim Kardashian about how she has no culture and uh-huh. I don't know her. I'm just making an observation that a lot of people make and based on her, you know, her behaviors, totally right. with no awareness that like there's a chance that like she's just scrolling through and here's me just, and I don't know what that means for my life. I was hoping that maybe she'd tweet at me. That would mean something, I guess, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. like that kind of a, ability to like block out those nerves, I guess mm-hmm. is a, is a pretty solid ability, but I'd say that's probably for anything. Like when, you know, as a writer, I'm sure you have to sit there and when you submit, you know, something to be, you know, critiqued or judged or edited, you have to, there's a probably a moment where you're like, here we go. Oh, yeah. Every every go. single moment. Yeah. You send it off mm-hmm. like with my first book when I put it out. I had to practically hide in my house for the first week because I knew people were out there reading it and I was terrified. Yeah. I, yeah. I spent four years writing it. That was the goal. But then when it really came to happen, I was like, oh, crap. No. And I kind of feel like, like that you... with the podcast, too. It's like yeah. I wanted to do this, but now I don't want to hear I don't want to hear my voice and I don't want to hear anything that anybody has to say about it. But it's fun. <laughs> it's like when you send out an important email that you need a response to and mm-hmm. that response is either a yes or no positive or negative and you you see that email they replied and it, it takes you a little bit of time to work up the courage to open it <laughs> to say because <laughs> yeah. you know it's going to change your day like you know yeah. whatever's in that email is going to change the outlook of your day whether it's yeah great this is an awesome idea you should do it or like absolutely not <laughs> you know so <laughs> I've had to set my phone down and be like oh gotta reply and just walk away from it Like it's a, you know, like it's a about to explode or something. Right. Yeah. That feedback, you can put it away when it's an email, but you were a teacher. I was a teacher. You're kind of faced with like, you know, live or die right in that moment when you're teaching. So you're up there in front of those kids and you can't walk away. You can't hide from it. So, yeah, I always felt like teaching. I, I taught kindergarten. Um, I did one year in kindergarten, then I subbed and (laughs) I always felt like immediately, I think every kid knew that I was in over my head. (laughs) <laughs> from the moment they walked in the room. So I feel like we had a real good, like, you know, they learned, they they did the kindergarten stuff. There's not a whole lot you got to do, you know, we're working on, you know, a uh, little bit of reading, a little bit of signing your name, some cursive for whatever reason, we still teach kids cursive. Um, and, and But I feel like they could just tell because I was younger and not like any other teacher they had in uh-huh. the school at any other time. Um, they kind of, They took it easy on me a little bit. And I think we skated that year a little bit on sense of humor. But I remember the second day into teaching kindergarten, I was like, well, this is a one and done year for me. I will not be a full time teacher next year. (laughs) Yeah, that's how I felt after my first year, too. I taught high school ESOL. So all of my students were brand new immigrants from Guatemala. And it was quite an experience because I was trained in middle grades language arts and I was not prepared Mm -hmm. for that. Um, But I know in in your stand up, you talk about the kids eating boogers. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of the same way with these high school kids. They'll, some of these kids will sit in the back of the classroom and eat their boogers, and then they'll ask to go to the bathroom and go have sex with somebody in the bathroom. It's like... Oh, jeez. <laughs> you kind of get the yeah, worst have, of all worlds there. We didn't have so much of that stuff, but it would have been funny because I, I was such a... I was kind of sheltered as, I, as in my own high school upbringing. I grew up on an island. My graduating class had 60 people in it. And wow. so we didn't really have... like. If I would have ever heard that someone skipped, that someone went to into the bathroom and had sex during school, I'd be like, whoa, really? That's great. Because in, in my <laughs> school, great. like, you know, everybody had known each other since we were, you know, kindergartners. And every, by that point in time in high school, everyone was like, nah, we're not dating any. Like, no one's dating each other anymore. Everyone's just ready to move. Like, yeah. Oh, no, no. And they're done that. Finished with exactly. that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, it's definitely crazy in the high schools these days. Um, my very first day of my first job, Two kids got kit got caught having sex in the bathroom. Very Jeez. first day of school. Why are you going to do that? <laughs> but they were famous, you know. Oh yeah, you're legendary at the school for that. That's oh yeah. I've always I've always wondered, and this is something that I've always been interested in because of just the racial dynamics. And I know that li- my girlfriend grew up in Kennesaw, okay. went to school in Kennesaw, and we had a conversation once because I was so fascinated growing up in the Puget Sound, Pacific Northwest. Learning, we learned about slavery from people who grew up in the Northwest, people who have no vested interest in the hi- in the mm. history of slavery or the South, other than we read about it in a history book too, and yeah. we're going to tell you guys what we learned in a history book. Like I'd never met anybody who'd been to the South. I'd never been a Southerner in my entire life. 
Oh, wow. And we were driving to Savannah, Georgia once. And I remember being so fascinated that they still use the word plantation or you can go to this plantation or this, <sighs> or we be in Savannah and we'd be on this ghost tour and every single ghost tour was the same. It's like, well, this house is haunted by a crazy old white guy who, yep. who raped a bunch of people and kill. And then it's like, man, why? How come there's no black ghosts? Aren't black people pissed off? And it's like, wh- why is there only white, the crazy old white men? Why are they ghosts down here? And so we, her and I were talking and we were going through like different historical monuments in Savannah. And we started talking about the Civil War. And um, I grew up like, st- like specifically we learned growing up in my schools in the Northwest mm-hmm. that slavery was all about or that the Civil War all about slavery. And she learned growing up that it was that was about states rights. Yes. Yeah. And one of those rights was the right to have slave, like the primary right mm-hmm. was. The, but it was. But the emphasis was always, no, it's states rights where, where I never heard one thing about states rights growing up in the Pacific Northwest. And I think it's because it was easier for kindergarten teachers and, you know, or we, I think we learned about um, Civil War and stuff in maybe third grade, second or third grade. Mm-hmm. And it was. It was so much easier to vilify the South. Like, oh, my, can you believe what they did down there? Because we don't know anybody from there. Yeah. Um, it was easier for us to be like, well, we would never do that. Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> thank, thankfully, the North would put an end to that. You know, like the, the perspective was so warped. Right. And I've always like- been interested in the dynamics of having to teach things in history that are really rough, like slavery, that impact the, the community still. That st- mm-hmm. And you have people that live in the South that are descendants from both sides of that aisle of slavery, you know, like yeah. how and you grew up in the South. How like how do those dynamics change? Do you think? I don't think that the dynamics have changed much in the South since the Civil War, to be really honest, unless you're in a really mm-hmm. urban city fied area. I think that people are really good at pretending that things uh-huh. are different, but I think that they're not. Um, the school that I taught at, it was, it's very rural. The population was probably 30% Hispanic, 30%, probably 30% Hispanic than the rest, white and African-American. And they were all really very separate, very much at, at odds with each other. Most of the teachers were white. So, you know, it just was different. The mm-hmm. Hispanic kids were treated as less than, and I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble by people that teach in the school system that are, that are hearing this, but right, right. Yeah, they were not treated well. They were not treated like equals. And I think that, um, yeah, it's just, there's still a lot of racism. There's still a lot of, um, I, I don't want to say that white people don't want to admit that what they did was wrong, but it is kind of like it was a, a fight about states' rights and we can do right. what we want. I don't think that people want to change a lot about that. And it's kind of like that. Um, my husband is Indian. We've always lived in the South. We've lived mm-hmm. in the Atlanta area for 25 years. People still look at him differently. He's like one of three yeah. Indians, I think, in our little community. And it's just different. And they don't really want to know anymore. And that's one of the reasons that I do this podcast, because people need to know they need to hear stories. And if you're not exposed to different stories, you're not going to learn. I I think people like to pretend that slavery and that, I mean, good God, like Jim Crow laws and the civil rights movement were in the 60s. I think we'd like to think that in this country, I think that when, you know, the Civil War happened and slavery was abolished. I think that for white people nowadays, like, like, no, that happened so long ago. We're good. We're good. We're good. That's, a, <laughs> yeah. that's so long ago without addressing any of the um, the uh, the th- the factors that contribute to still people that are, you know, disenfranchised and at a disadvantage in certain communities. The dis- you know, the um, I think we like to look at, you know, that that wasn't that long ago in this grand scope no. of history. Three, you know, 300 years, 250 years is not a long time to go from people being treated like property and and, you know, murdered and, you know, like you got murders and lynchings and things and violence and racism happening mm-hmm. in the South. And I mean, not even the South, all over this country, like, I mean, the, the atrocities that happened out in the way in the West with Native Americans, and things that by no means that's th- these are not isolated things. 
Right. We like to pretend that it happened so long ago in one respect where it's kind of like, let's just move on, everybody. Are we good? <laughs> but then you do yeah. see a lot of like inherent like um, racism in terms of and I, I think people are getting more comfortable with being voicing that racism now, unfortunately, based on like the political climate we have and this whole like snowflake culture where people are just unwilling to ever see the other side of someone's perspective, whether you want to call it racism or not, like to go back to the Kim Kardashian thing, you know, instead of calling everybody who's of Japanese descent, a bunch of snowflake babies for being mad about her taking kimono. Why don't you ask why it hurts? You know, right. why, why don't you say like, Oh, I'll, you know, I'll default to your perspective or, or when you look at like police brutality with people of color and everyone's like, well, this, this is a crazy thing. This epidemic is like, this is not just a new thing. It's just newly being videotaped. These have been mm -hmm. things that have been happening in these communities for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is why there is a huge distrust amongst, you know, African-American communities and other communities of, of, with people of color who have been judged on their complexion out mm -hmm. the jump at every interaction they've had with law enforcement, it's been an, like an evolving process. And I think that we like to pretend that those things don't exist in white America until right. it suits us to pretend that it does. Yep. And now we just can see it more because of social media and it's spread around a lot more. And, you know, speaking of the political climate, when I was teaching, it was the year of our most recent president's election. We, as teachers, weren't even allowed to talk about the election the next day. We weren't allowed to show the inauguration in our classrooms. We couldn't talk wow. about it with the students. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> because there were so many kids that were Hispanic. They knew yeah. that it was going to cause some sort of a, a clash. And it was absolutely ridiculous well, to me because I thought we needed to talk about it. This is school. This is where they need to hear about it, right? As teachers, as students. It, especially with, I mean, you talk about Latino populations, right? Like I live in California now and we have 60% or like 55% of the population in Southern California has Latino uh, roots of some, of some varying degree because of how long that Latinos have been in this community. You've got a lot of, you know, the, the cultural blending, which is fantastic, but it is a thing that's real. And so much of that election was based on the wall um, mm -hmm. immigration, things that hit close to home for a lot of even American citizens who have family members who are maybe undocumented, maybe are dreamers, things mm -hmm. like that. And what I noticed when I was working in the South on radio, it, it became politics became a topic we could not touch on in morning radio either. No one wanted oh, to hear yeah. about it mm -hmm. instead of everybody going like, well, look, I mean, we can all say that some like we, this, this, uh, political race has been, weaponized in terms of dr draw driving a wedge into people like Republicans and Democrats. Like I, there was no way after Trump won that we were all going to come together and just hold yeah. hands because of the way that those, those campaigns were run. They were run aggressively. They were run, never mm -hmm. apologize. They were run. If you're offended, it's you, not me. So right. yeah, you can't, can't fire up populations of people on two sides of the fence and expect as soon as like the outcome happens that everyone's going to high five in the center <laughs> and be like, God, oh, let's come together and make some positive change in this country. Yeah, um, and in Atlanta, not. yeah, Atlanta was really interesting because people, and especially on morning radio, you would talk to people who, man, we have so, so much in common, everything. And then all of a sudden politics comes up and it's like, wow, this, wow, you this. And, and it became such a divisive, um, topic that i mean initially we were going to try to do a thing on the bird show where um we were going to find someone from who was a trump fan and hillary fan and the people who said they if the other person won they were leaving moving to canada we were going to do a thing where we were going to like finance their move to canada but <laughs> we realized because awesome. we thought it'd be really funny and it'd be a way to kind of talk about you know both sides and not have a side on it because yeah. you know we're not a political show by nature but it was a thing where it the the election got so dirty, so nasty, so controversial that it really became something that it wasn't even funny to talk about trying to move somebody to Canada if their candidate lost. Right. So and and you even see it now with you know with the uh, the governor's election, the you know oh. the, the recount, <laughs> yeah. the, the voting day disasters, the you know, and then as soon as you know, now you see it with the abortion stuff. It's just. This country is in a it, it was turned on its head in a like kind of an environment of chaos in mm -hmm. 2016. And it has not 
come close to rebounding in any sort of way that makes anybody in any sort of political party feel comfortable. No. And I don't even know what the solution is because I feel, and I think a lot of people feel like you can't really express your opinions on Facebook because somebody's going to just destroy you. Um, oh, I feel yeah. like I can't even talk to people in person. Like my husband is a dentist. Okay. So he, he's very conservative and his peer group is very conservative, very Republican. I can't talk about my feelings about abortion. I don't think that mm-hmm. I don't even want to live in Atlanta. I don't want to live in Georgia because of this abortion ban. Um, but I can't express that to people. People because then they're going to look at me like I'm just some bleeding heart liberal and they're going to criticize me. My husband has even said, don't put anything out on social media. Don't talk to right. anybody about it out in public. And I just hate that because how do you overcome those problems if you can't talk about it? So but there's never um, a way to bring those things up in a way that like people feel because people will latch on to the hot button topics and they'll just see the word abortion. And then it's like everything yeah. else turns into Charlie Brown's teacher talking yeah. like wah, wah. they don't even hear it they just want to voice their own opinion and i remember look like i i have i've worked in conservative liberal areas i've and i've learned that look you can have a discussion about the things and my thing with people who are big fans of the heartbeat bill in georgia or like yeah they they believe that every um every pregnancy is god's gift and sh- and and has rights okay well if that's your stance i'm okay with it if you're going to be consistent throughout the life of that individual yes. so if you are very pro life be pro life the entire spectrum of the human life don't mm-hmm. start slashing funding for for kids because they come from low income backgrounds from a mother who may or may not have wanted or needed to not have that pregnancy or not you know terminate the pregnancy because now you just don't want to pay money because you want to be conservative there. You can't pick and choose. It's not a buffet. If you're pro-life, be pro-life all the way. And if someone is that person who votes for every single education, social justice, social service initiative, and they hate abortion, I'm like, look, logically, what you're saying, that's your life. It's the people who then vote everything down. Don't take any money from my taxes. But also, I believe that Jesus wants you to have that baby that, mm-hmm. you know, that 16 year old who, you know, may have been sexually assaulted or whatever, but now can't afford or didn't know or was hiding a pregnancy way too long from parents to even right. get an abortion. Yeah, there was just recently beginning of this month, I think, in Forsyth County here in Georgia, there was a baby found in a plastic bag out in the woods behind somebody's house. That's the kind of thing that happens when you don't allow women right. to to do what they need to do. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a solution to that for sure, but I sure wish that there was some way that we could come to some sort of agreement and not attack each other all the time. I, I feel like I don't know if there's going to be an uh, I don't think as a country we're, we're going to be able to come together until we stop with this. Like, if you're offended, it's a you thing. Like, I think everyone yeah. needs to have an, enough introspection. And I offend people plenty just by <laughs> trying to make jokes and stuff. But look, I'm not trying to. And if you have a, a, a an opinion that differ, that's different from mine, I'm willing to see the logical argument of it. But at the end of the day, if it's just like, well, that's just because what I believe. And I'm look, I'm not interested in having that conversation because you are just, you have your knee jerk reaction. And you're going to stick to it and you're mm-hmm. going to be offended. I think we all need, if someone's offended, ask why. And if, and if you, and you find out why they're offended and it's completely asinine ridiculous, then move on with your life. But if they have a point, then okay, you have a point there. I didn't see yeah. it that way. Yeah. But and it's I'm okay. To, I'm not a, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, my son had a really big awakening. Um, he just graduated from high school. I've got twins that just started college. One of them got accepted to the Tisch theater school at NYU. And we're like, oh, crap, if you got accepted there, we have to let you go. So he moved up to New York City this year. Yeah. And it's been a huge culture shock, but it's been a huge cultural awakening for him too to be among people that have such a different, well, there's so many different ways of thinking up there, but predominantly so liberal. And he's just in heaven. He loves it there because he just feels like, wow, you know, it's so much more accepting. When you were raising your kids, you know, multicultural, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming, right? So, like, you know, your husband's Indian. Mm -hmm. And how is that process when you come to... Because, look, like, your kids can be racially targeted, you know, inappropriately. Or is there a way that you... Is that as a mother who has kids that have a different complexion um, than you do in this environment? Like, what kind of things do you talk about? Do you... 
And and how do you educate someone like, look, the South is different. Do you have those conversations with them? Oh, yeah, we definitely have those conversations because my family is from Kentucky. OK, I never lived in Kentucky, but the whole gang is from there. So it's a it's a very Southern way of thinking. And mm-hmm. um, we've always lived here and we had to just kind of laugh about it. We in our family, we just laugh about who's the brownest, who's the whitest. We want them to be totally okay with it. And if anybody Mm -hmm. gives them a hard time with it, I just always wanted them to be totally okay with who they are. But then there were issues like my son was at Georgia Southern University and he was out camping one time and they got lost. And he was with all of his white friends and they came upon a, I don't know, a trailer in the backwoods. And there was a guy that was there with a tote and a rifle. And he said, I'll take you back to camp. And he kept calling him Jose. Because they just don't, yeah. people just don't know what he is. And sometimes they'll come out and ask, what are you? And, you know, right. my, or, my kids. Or what is your name is generally the most <laughs> polite way to, yeah. you know, yeah. to come up with like a racial based thing. Yeah. And it doesn't always happen. But um, my daughter has really made it work for her because she works at a hotel in New York City. And she can be any race you want her to be. So that international mm-hmm. clientele, they come up there and they everybody feels comfortable with her because she looks a little bit white. She looks a little bit Arab. She looks a little bit Italian. So we've just always taught them, you know, work with it. And if somebody doesn't like you, you know, tell them to F off and just keep on walking because it's not you, yeah. it's them. Yeah. I mean, nobody who is going to make a snap decision on somebody based on the on on what they perceive as their ethnicity. I mean, that's a reflection of who they are internally. Yeah. I know we've been dealing with a lot in Southern California. And I think it's happening around the country too, but I think it's, it's, I think it's more of a new thing for more liberal areas where, and it's happening now, I think more because I don't know what the, what the the trend is of kids on social media thinking it's cute or funny to be racist on Snapchat Mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think there's a problem in a number of ways. One, I think parents need to be way better educating their kids on social media in general. And once you put something out, it's out there. It doesn't matter if you were trying to be funny putting blackface on and dropping the n-word yeah. like you're a white person that's going to trend and people are going to make judge well i'm not racist well i only have one thing to base your character on and that's this video and so i'm going to go ahead and err on the side of your racist right it, absolutely i don't know you i only know what i'm seeing right here and i've had i've you know i've i've had it out with radio personalities who are more on the conservative side um about the okay hand sign because that's a sign that's been um, a hand gesture that's been kind of commandeered by white supremacists as a white power thing. Mm-hmm. And then you get this kind of like, and I feel like this whole, this trend of kind of woe was me, white guy, oh, we can't do anything right. <sighs> it's kind of emerged in the last few years. We're like, oh, everything's offensive that I do. Uh-huh. And I tell people like, no, everything is not offensive. You're smart enough to know everything. When you throw up a hand sign, 100% of the time, Your intent is always very clear, whether you're flipping someone the bird or you're throwing up an okay sign because you're like, got it. Roger that. okay, or you're or you're in a white power rally throwing up an okay sign. Or if you're a white kid in blackface throwing up an okay sign, it's it, it baffles me that we've hit a point where white men are are kind of acting like, oh, we can't we just can't get it right. Everything's offensive. No, Uh everything's not offensive. You know exactly when something's offensive. It's no one's come out of the woodwork and been like, you just did that hand sign. You're a fan. You're like, no, I was just telling my, my kid that everything's OK. Like, you're going to be fine. You just scuffed a knee. No one's calling you racist. They're calling you racist when you're doing it in a white power parade in Orlando, right. you know, wearing a Make America Great Again hat, screaming white power like that mm-hmm. is when it's racist. Yeah, absolutely. It's such I- a strange phenomenon. It really is. And I I hear that kind of argument about the whole Me Too movement, too. Men are saying, oh, we can't do anything right. Everybody says that, you know, whatever we do, a woman's going to take advantage of that and, you know, go to the public, go to the media and say, you know, he assaulted me. That's just bull. Just don't do it. And then the women won't say it about you. You know, that's all you have to do. Be a, a gentleman. Every time I have a guy and I've like I work in the comedy world where people are like, oh, God, here we go. It's like, dude, then, you know, you've been a creep. Like you've been yeah. creepy. You've done creepy things. The the fact that you're you're trying to play this like I can't do anything right victim is because you feel insecure about the behaviors that you've engaged in, in the past. Now, look, if you owe some people uh, an apology, like, look, I was very inappropriate. I was drunk and hitting on you. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Um, also, if you've committed 
acts of sexual assault, then you have whatever you have coming to you. But to act like there's some sort of, oh, now I can't compliment a woman. It's like, no, now you're more mm-hmm. cognizant of what and what isn't an inappropriate compliment. Telling someone right. they got a nice ass is probably not the compliment that anyone wants to hear because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And so it, I, I just believe we're smart enough to figure these things out. And I do, I agree with you that this, the the thing with with me too i think it made a lot of people look at themselves and the people that reacted in insecure ways were people that looked at their own lives and were like oh good lord i have not been very good i have not been very respectful of women in mm-hmm. general in my life and you can clean that up at any point in time my friend you don't have to just yeah. you don't have to now argue that everyone's in trouble for trying to hit on a girl it's like no just be you know what i don't see anything wrong with being a human being Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when you protest too much, then, you know, we know what is behind that. Yep. So, okay. So you were a teacher and what brought you to teaching? I'm just really curious about that because of what you do now. How did you go from being a Uh, teacher to this? And do you think that there's an evolution of helping people? I'm sure you wanted to help people as a teacher. So do you think you're helping people now? Well, I got into teaching just because I didn't really know what I wanted to be. And I had a psychology degree. And when I moved back to the state of Washington after college, they were in an emergency situation with classrooms that had behavior issues. So I was a psychology major and I took some education classes. So they credentialed me just for Uh, um, like at risk youth kindergarten. And so I was more in the behavior area. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always wanted to help people. I just, I didn't really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, I went to a school that had a broadcast program, a really good one. And I took psychology because I played basketball and I didn't really know what else to do with my life. And then when my MBA dreams became more of like a (laughs) really not going to happen, I started just doing stand up comedy just at night because I felt like I, I'd never, I'd never had a creative outlet really. Uh Uh-huh. Um, I played, you know, I was, I played in the high school jazz band for a while. Um, but I just, I didn't really know. I had no clue. So I just started doing stand up and started getting into radio just by when you start touring on the road, you uh, get asked to go sit in on radio shows and promote the shows that you're doing for stand up and thought that'd be kind of fun. So I used to hit up, um, radio stations when I was on the road and be like, Hey, I'm in town on Thursday doing a show. Is it cool if I come by and hang out and goof around like here's a sample of some of my other appearances and you'd hit up a lot of afternoon rock shows who were just so sick of each other and sick of talking to each other they'd they'd welcome (laughs) anybody in the room um and then i went i went back to get my master's in social work because i've always been very like politically oriented in terms of like public policy Mm -hmm. um i wanted to so i got a social work degree in boston at boston college and i um emphasized my emphasis was public policy I worked at the state house in Boston for a while. I mean, mind you, the whole time I was doing three to four stand-up shows a night. Wow. And just, like just hitting every room from like open mics at coffee shops to bar shows late nights to comedy clubs. And when I got out of college, um, it was really hard to find a social work job. <laughs> so I started just touring. I started just touring clubs and colleges and, you know, goofing around on radio when I had the chance. And I did mm-hmm. an MTV prank show for two seasons. I was based out of New York. Okay. Um, I was a cast member on it, just goofing around and then slowly kind of found my way into radio. But I've always been very active in the, the fundraising part. Um, I've I think me me going to graduate school was two things. One, I come from like a very um, hardworking Irish family with my grandparents are all immigrants. So, you know dropping out of not not getting a master's degree was never an option with my grandmother gotcha. and my parents were just like yo she's gonna be so pissed if you try to be a comedian <laughs> so but Kinda i also like think an that, indian family right yeah you just had no choice i was like <laughs> right. okay i guess i'll just keep and they respected social work because they respect social justice okay. um and so i went uh and i think for me getting a social work degree has always kind of forced me to look at things from a policy standpoint but also what's fair what's not fair. Um, and you know, it's funny cause now, you know, now I do get a regular paycheck. I do have benefits for so nice. long, many times in my life, I've been skating on the system, you know, never having health insurance and all that mm-hmm. and, you know, stealing Wi-Fi or whatever. So now it's kind of <laughs> like, all right, it's my turn to pay back into the system. I, I, I feel like my social work background, it makes me really want to use the the radio platform to one entertain. I mean, that's really what I got into this whole thing to do. But also, mm-hmm. you know, when people hit us up about fundraisers and 
um, you know, I, I have like a, a kind of the, the spot that I really love to help out with is special needs and, you know, education policy mm-hmm. for low income at risk youth. It's like what, you know, how can we donate or raise money to help kids with, you know, uh, take home lunch programs for the weekends for low income areas that don't have, you know, their kids, the last good meal the kids get is on Friday afternoon and they don't get another good one until Monday morning. Yeah. They're just living on potato chips all weekend. So trying to do things like that. And I think that radio and just entertainment in general is like a, afforded me the ability to blend those two things where I kind of had to go to graduate school to learn about public policy and social mm-hmm. justice and find out who I was as a human being, like where am I? my heart lies to then being effective at making people laugh about, you know, ripping on the Kardashians. And then the next minute we're trying to raise money for kids to go back to school, you know? Yeah. You got to get people laughing so you can get them listening to the good stuff. (laughs) That's a good good way to do it. I think, well, if people like you inherently, they'll, they'll, they'll bitch at you less. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You'll get less hate on your Instagram comments. If people have some sort of likeness or they like you a little bit. That is a good thing. Well, I must be very loved because I get all kinds of offers on my Facebook and my uh, my Instagram. Like I just got a message a couple months ago from this guy that he looked like a Bollywood star in his profile picture. And he said, hey, white woman, white woman, I want to have your baby. So I get that kind of stuff all the time. So maybe people like me. <laughs> Did you also tell him like, look, man, if you've got some technology that lets you have my baby, that's great because you I should know. sell that. Because Absolutely. right now I feel like I'm going to have to do all the work in that situation just inherently. <laughs> right. I feel like it's more me having yours. Technically, I don't know how you know how baby stuff works, but. Yeah, I don't know. Well, he, he didn't know how to write English very well either. So I don't know he's, if he's a very good candidate. You're like, I've done this five times and it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. And I am so done. I would never do it again. That's funny. Um, yeah. So, OK, I have to ask you just from a mom's point of view, because I've got a kid that uh-huh. wants to go into show business. He is getting this theater degree at NYU super freaking expensive and he'll never be able yep. to use it for anything else but showbiz. So right. do you think that the way you did it is a better way or the way he's doing it? Because I mean, what are the I chances think, he's going to be waiting tables when he gets out of school? I think that there's, I think the one thing that he do, cause here's the thing. I think that both ways have positives and negatives, you know, like the, the way that I'm, that I did it was more life experience, more, things to talk about. My perspective wasn't, wasn't as narrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that can be a problem with, with people who go straight into acting and showbiz school. You keep your circles very tight. Yeah. You don't change your environment very often. Um, and I think that that's important just as a human being. Um, but then eventually you run into the problem where um, you don't have, like the people that he's going to school with are eventually going to be the power players in different areas of entertainment. They won't mm-hmm. all be actors. Some of them end up as agents, casting yeah. directors, producers, directors, writers. So that part of it of school is the most valuable part of it. I mean, mm-hmm. I missed out on that with my social work degree because all I did was move straight out of Boston and to LA and was doing stand up when, you know, all the connections that your school has are all in the area. So mm-hmm. the thing I would tell him to do is always try to get new experiences, but also do the things that the people who aren't going to school are doing when he has the time, Mm -hmm. like take improv classes at UCB or second city or do open mics at weird coffee shops. Even if he doesn't want to be a stand up, just do the things that the other people who aren't in school are doing to hustle. And you can kind of get the best of both worlds because ultimately you're going to have a leg up on everybody in terms of the, uh, the connections you have. We all end up waiting tables or, or worse um, in show business. I mean, I was working in warehouses for a while. Uh-huh. I was working overnight shifts in Boston as a intake coordinator at homeless shelters and then going straight to uh, another job. So, wow. I, but those are all experiences I think that um, kind of add to the fabric of your creative perspective. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'll make sure he listens to this so he can get that advice because yeah. he sure doesn't listen. Tell him to him. He, he's got to hit, he's got to hit one of those laundry mat open mics in Brooklyn. <laughs> that is just a bunch of comedians doing laundry and they're all looking at their notebooks. And if you get anybody to listen to you, you're doing great. But but really, you're just you're just learning to appreciate the hustle that everybody's doing, who eventually is going to try to compete with you for your jobs. But they come from different perspectives. Right. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. You just got to get out there and, and hustle and push. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So what are you doing now? You're you're doing your radio in L.A., but do you travel the country doing stand up? I know you're coming here to I, Atlanta in August. I try to travel as much as possible. It's been a little bit difficult um, lately just because starting a brand new radio show takes up a lot of time. And, you know, we we're doing a campaign on our morning show where we're crashing listener parties all summer long. So <sighs> like I've been to bar mitzvahs, I've been to quinceañeras, I've been to barbecues in Inglewood. I've awesome. been to, you know, t- yeah, just crazy wild parties all over Southern California, just with listeners in the backyard. Uh-huh. Um, so I haven't traveled as much. I, I perform a lot in Atlanta, um, Woodstock. I'm there August 24th. Woo-hoo. Um, setting up something for uh, Marietta at the Strand Theater probably in October. Okay. Um, like once every three months, I'd like to get out to Atlanta and do a show. I'm actually going to do a show at Fetch Dog Park and Bar this Saturday <laughs> night. Just oh. doing, I'm jumping on their show, nice. uh, which is a cool dog park bar down in uh, East Atlanta. Um, and I try to get to Dallas a little bit, Nashville, other markets I've been on radio, Seattle, Salt Lake City. But it's I have to tour deliberately where, you know, I try to do one night shows instead of two because the weeks for me are so busy. And sometimes it's a bummer to perform all weekend when you've been working all week and you have oh, friends yeah. come out and see you and they're like, hey, what are you doing? And you're like, I have another show. Uh, I'm you guys want to hang around? <laughs> I'm working the entire time. Um and so, yeah, so this and this year I'm trying to do a couple more TV things than I did last year, I'm trying to trying to loosen up that because the mm-hmm. first year of I mean, starting a brand new radio show is uh, time intensive and uh, it, it's different than, you know, when you're on an established morning show, you can roll in there with a little bit of a hangover and just swing for the <laughs> fence the whole show and just uh-huh. try to make people laugh. But when it's your job to design the entire show, make sure that it is things are happening at the right times and, you know, to to win in terms of ratings. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah, you got to be on top of your game at all times. Right. And maintain my relationship with my girlfriend, who I love dearly, but <laughs> she's <laughs> in Atlanta. So it's like trying to balance all those things at one time. And she's yeah. been super supportive of of the creative um, aspects of what I do. I mean, she was the first person to know that Los Angeles had been interested in or was interested in trying to get me for starting a new show. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you need to do it. I mean, you've always wanted to be in Los Angeles again. So. She's like, you'd be miserable if you stayed here. And I'm like, I don't know if I'd be miserable because I still love it. But Yeah. Well, sounds like she really loves you because she wouldn't have let you go if she didn't. Most days. Most <laughs> days she does. <laughs> but you know I what? I be a bit of a handful. I think living apart can be a really good thing because uh, familiarity definitely breeds contempt if you're stuck together all the time. So maybe it's a good thing. That's what I told her. I said, look, if, if we're going to be together for the next 45, 50 years, however long we both live, like at some point in time, we're going to run out of stuff to tell each other. So maybe we should keep some of these stories, like, you know, write them down in a notebook and we'll <laughs> go back and we'll start doing the greatest <laughs> hits when we're, in our, when we're in our 60s. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I know when my husband goes out of town, I'm so much happier to see him when he comes home than I am right. every morning. <laughs> it's a good see, thing. Yeah, see, it's like the dogs are happy to see me. She's happy to see me we go out and have a good time. That's we were right. talking about why we were... The other day we were talking about why it's hard for us to save money. I'm like, well, that's because every time I, we're living like we're on vacation every weekend because you're either here or I'm there. And we're like, let's go eat dinner on a rooftop. You know? Yeah, it's a big <laughs> celebration. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't wait to be able to see you next time you're in Atlanta. I'm not going to be able to see you in August because I'm going to be up in New York. But maybe I'll get to Marietta to see you in October. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. I, I love performing in Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta all the time, too. So if you just ever just track me down on social media, usually I'll usually be popping up at the punchline or the laughing skull or somewhere around town just because, you know, I love telling jokes. Awesome. Well, you're good at it. That's for sure. Well, thank, thank you. So you. Much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so oh, much was, for being here with me, with you, was, with me. It was great. Any, <laughs> and me, you, I mean, right now it's like we're both in virtual studios across the country. So who knows who's with who? At this That's point. right. Yeah. We're, we're just <laughs> together over the internet. That's all that matters. True. Yeah. Thanks Anytime, so much. Anytime I'll come back. Anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. If you like this podcast so far, please continue following along by tapping the subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. If you really liked it, go on, be awesome, and leave a rating and a review. Find me on all social media, too, by searching Cheryl with an S, Parboo, that's P-A-R-B-H-O-O. 
Thanks for listening to Southern Life Indian Wife. Hi, welcome to this ad for new Subway sliders starting at $189 each. How do you want it? Cheer squad. Give me a 189 ham and jack slider. 189 ham and jack slider. Give me a 189 Italian spice slider. 189 Italian spice slider. What's that spell? Uh, doesn't really spell anything. New Subway sliders starting at 189 each. Go sliders! Customization for flavored cheese and sauce. Participating shops plus tax. Price higher on delivery. Prices higher in Alaska and Hawaii.